phoning the local council about an abandoned vehicle. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Environmental Health Department, Paul speaking. Oh, hello. Um... I wanted to report a vehicle that's been left parked near where I live. I think it's been abandoned. I wondered if the council could arrange to get it towed away. Have I got through to the right department? Yes, you have. If I could just take a few details. Your name, please. Mrs. Shefford. Thank you. It's not my vehicle, though. I just thought someone ought to report it. No, that's fine. What I need to do is take some details first... Then we can decide what to do about the problem. Oh, I see. So the next thing I need to know is your address. Right, it's 41 Lower Green Street. Yes. Barrowdale. And the postcode's WH45JP. Fine. And if I could just ask for a telephone number. It's 01778552. 87. I'm out quite a lot, but you can just leave a message on the answer phone if you need to. Or I could give you my mobile number. That's all right, don't worry. Now, could you tell me a little more about this vehicle? You say it's been abandoned. Well, it certainly looks like it. Can you give me an idea of where it is? Yes, it's near the main road that goes through Barrowdale. Is that the A69? Yes, that's right. Now, there's the primary school just towards the end of the village, and then next to that, next to the children's playground, there's a field, and it's in there. Oh. I wonder how it got in there. Well, there's a gate to allow farm machinery in and out. I, I thought something ought to be done about it. The children from the school might start playing in the vehicle and lock themselves in or something. Yes. You are quite right to report it. And what type of vehicle are we talking about here? It's a van, actually. You know, the sort with just a couple of little windows at the back. Right. You don't happen to know the make and model, do you? Oh, yes. I went and had a look and got all the details. I thought you might need them. I'm surprised the school hasn't contacted you about it. Anyway, I wrote the details down. Uh, right. It's a Katala, and the model's a Flyer 2000. Is that F-L-Y-E-R? That's right. Very good. And the colour? Well, it's not all that easy to see because it's absolutely filthy. And actually, it looks as if it's had a paint job at some stage. It's blue, but you can just see white underneath where it's been scratched. Right. Well, I'll just make a note of the present colour. And if you could just tell me the vehicle number. Did you make a note of that? Oh, yes. It's... S-322-G-E-C. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And it sounds as if the general condition of the vehicle isn't too good, from what you say. No, it's pretty poor. It wouldn't be drivable. It's got a flat tyre and there's a crack in the windscreen. I reckon someone just wanted to get rid of it. That's usually the way. It's been there for nearly a week. No, it must be eight days. I remember it was a Sunday morning when I noticed it. It wasn't there the day before. 
I walk past it most days on the way to the shops. I'd have thought the school would have reported it. Does the field actually belong to the school? No, it's part of Hill Farm Estate. Right. I'll just make a note of that. And I don't suppose you have any information about who might own the vehicle? No, I've no idea. So what will you do now? Well, we'll come and have a look and see if we can trace the owner. And if we can't, the vehicle will be removed as rapidly as the law permits. It could be anything up to 20 days. One thing I should say, I'm quite sure this doesn't belong to anyone round here. I'd definitely recognise it if it was from someone who lived here. So you don't think it was anyone local? Right. I'd say at a guess we're looking at a stolen vehicle here. I did wonder if it might have been. You hear such a lot about car thieves nowadays. Well, we certainly will be looking into that possibility. Anyway, thank you for contacting us, Mrs. Shefford, and we'll keep you informed of what happens. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a historic town on the east coast of the USA. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Right. So here we are in Fairhaven, and we have a couple of hours to spend in this historic center before we carry on to our motel. And as you'll know from the itinerary of our trip, we're visiting Fairhaven because of its historical links with a man called Manjiro Nakahama. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of his life, and then you can explore the town at your leisure. Well, Manjiro Nakahama, as he was then known, was born in 1827 in a village by the sea in what is now Toshishimazu in Japan. And like many people in that town, he became a fisherman when he was just a youngster. One day in 1841, when he was just 14 years old, he and some others were fishing far off the coast of Japan when they were caught in a storm and shipwrecked on a small deserted island. They had to wait for six months before they were rescued by an American whale ship that had stopped at the island by chance. Four of the five Japanese were put ashore in Hawaii, but Manjiro had become friends with a captain, William Whitfield, who came from the town of Fairhaven, where we are now and he chose to remain aboard and to return with the boat to the USA. So Manjiro unwittingly became the first Japanese ever to set foot on American soil. He came back right here to Fairhaven with Whitfield and stayed with the Whitfield family, who paid for his education here in the town. He studied mathematics and geography, as well as shipbuilding and navigation. But he missed his mother and his own country and eventually he went back to Japan, where he had a responsible position as a university teacher and also served an invaluable role as interpreter 
during the initiation of relations between Japan and the United States in the middle of the 19th century. But the most interesting thing is that the links between Toshishimizu and Fairhaven have remained and grown stronger over the years, in spite of the distance between them. And in fact, the two places now have the official status of sister cities. Both places are ports, so in fact the inhabitants have a lot in common. There have been a number of visits by the inhabitants of Toshishimizu, in particular at the time of the festival, which is held every two years here in Fairhaven to celebrate the life and achievements of John Manjiro. It takes place in the fall, and there's an ever growing program including drumming, singing, martial arts, and stalls selling Japanese and American food. So if you're going to be in the region around then, it's really worth a visit. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, many of the buildings that Manjiro Nakahama knew in Fairhaven are still standing today. And so if you'd just like to hand round some copies of this map, I'll suggest the best route to follow to see them. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the map, you can see the Millicent Library. And that's where we are now. Now, to follow the John Manjiro Trail, you go out of here along Center Street and then head up Main Street until you get to Pilgrim Avenue. Go down there and turn right at the end. Go straight on, and just on the corner with Oxford Street, you'll see a two-story house. This is the Whitfield family house, and this is where Manjiro first stayed when he came to Fairhaven. It's still a private residence, so please respect the owner's privacy. Okay, now if you carry on along Oxford Street, then turn left at the end, you'll come to North Street, and about halfway down there is what's known as Old Oxford School. This was the very same school that Manjiro attended when he lived here. It was considered to be the best school in town because of the quality of the building. Unusually, it was built of stone, and the quality of the teaching. Nowadays, it's usually closed, except on special occasions. Go on to the end of North Street and turn the corner onto Adams Street. If you follow the road down back towards the library, you go round a couple of sharp bends, and on the second of these, you can see the School of Navigation, which Manjiro also attended. And if you follow the road on, you'll soon find yourself back here at the library. And I'd suggest you spend some time looking round that, too if you have any time left. Right. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You'll hear a tutor and a student discussing transport. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, John. Come in. How's the paper going? 
Morning, Mr. Taylor. Pretty well, actually. Good, good. It's not all about bicycles, is it? I know you've got a thing about bicycles. Yes, but that's just. There are other ways to get around town, you know. Yes, I know, and I think I've researched pretty well all of them. Right then. So your paper's about urban transport in London, eh? Not just London, but that is going to be the focus. I've also looked at urban transport systems in cities around the world: Madrid, Beijing, Mexico City, Amsterdam, Paris, other countries too. You have been busy, haven't you? What's the purpose of your study? Well, two things really. I want to see if there are more efficient ways of organizing urban transport systems while cutting down on traffic congestion, and of course pollution, and to find ways of encouraging people to use public transport instead of their cars. Let's start with that then, with cars. I think you have a hard time thinking of ways to persuade people to swap their cars for a crowded bus or underground train. They're convenient, comfortable, faster, and sometimes they're a status symbol too. Okay, I agree that cars will probably always be the most popular means of transport, but there are ways to cut down the number of people who bring their cars into the city. It's a problem that affects every big city, and several methods have been tried. I know, I know, as I've found to my cost. When I go into London, which I do two or three times a week, I have to pay five pounds to get into the city centre. Has your research thrown up any more places where they do this? Oh yes, apart from London, there's Oslo, Stockholm, Singapore. Now there, in Singapore, they've got it really organised. They've imposed a tax on all roads leading into the city centre. And they have electronic sensors that identify each car, and then debit a credit card belonging to the owner. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. And other cities, instead of charging motorists to come into the city centre, have tried other measures, such as. Well, in Athens, cars are only allowed to go into the city centre on alternate days, depending on their license plate number. In Bogota and some other Latin American cities, such as Quito and Sao Paulo. They've developed what is called a BRT system. A what? A BRT system, a bus rapid transit system. People leave their cars outside the city and take buses, which have special express lanes into and through the city. It's been so successful that they're trying it out in Mexico City, Beijing, Seoul, and Taipei. And other cities are pedestrianizing more and more areas of the city center. I see. How have these measures affected traffic congestion and pollution levels? In most cases, it has led to a reduction in the number of cars entering the city center. Certainly, in Singapore, where it's now much easier to move around the city and the air is much cleaner than most other cities in that part of the world. London too, I believe. I can give some facts and figures if you like. Please do. In the first year after the tax was introduced, the number of people using buses to get to the city centre rose by thirty-eight percent. Really, thirty-eight percent? Incredible. Yes, and the number of cars entering central London dropped by about eighteen percent. There's more. The number of people using bicycles and mopeds went up seventeen percent. I knew we'd get to bicycles at some point.
Well, yes. In the city, the bicycle has a lot going for it. You can avoid traffic jams. There are no parking problems. They don't pollute. They're cheap to run, and they don't cost very much. Oh, and here's another fact for you: you can fit twenty bicycles in the space needed to park one car. Well, I never. But I can't see it catching on. Besides, we seem to be getting off the point. Not at all. China, Japan, and Holland have all integrated bicycles into their urban transport systems. In Holland and Japan, they've got special parking areas for commuters who get to the station by bike, and Japan has even built multi-story parking facilities for bikes close to railway stations. Then look at America. In New York, delivery services use bicycles because they can deliver messages and small parcels far more quickly and at much lower cost than cars or vans. Even the police use bicycles. In fact, in about 80 percent of the towns in America where the population is around half a million, the police regularly patrol on bicycles, and they have proved to be effective. Because they can reach the scene of an accident or crime faster and more quietly than officers in patrol cars, making a lot more arrests per officer. Well, you do know your bicycles, don't you? But I do need to hear more about the public transport system and what's to be done about that. And I'd like you to look a bit more into the economics of it, how much it will cost to improve the situation, and so on. Okay. Right. See you next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Bye, Mr. Taylor. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to a group of science students. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology. So you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession. Though the main point applies to all of you, and what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize, because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. 
a surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science, while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature. But reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine and psychology, for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-five to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-five to forty. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry, I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list, I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it. It's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's Wonderful Life. He writes brilliantly about natural history and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then there's Jared Diamond's *The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee*, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry, but don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, "Just a minute! These are all science books." What about the fiction? I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is *The Water Babies* by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. Well, it is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth, no, the fifth book on the list is a biography, *The Emperor of Scent* by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough 
dog-eat-dog business. Which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's Water Babies, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his The Voyage of the Beagle, which as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind, throughout whatever course you are studying, not to neglect other aspects of your wider, non-academic education. Thank you. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.